All around the world, many people have been imprisoned unjustly and their lives threatened. In this film, we find out about three individuals and the campaigners working to set them free. In 1988, a visit to relatives in Pakistan turned into a nightmare for Tahir Hussein, a British citizen from Leeds. On his second day, he took a trip in a taxi and was attacked by the driver wielding a gun. The driver took me to nearby bushes and tried to uh, rob and kill me. So defending myself, a scuffle took between us and the gun was uh, went off, hitting the taxi driver. Afterwards, uh, I went to the police myself and reported the incident to them, but they did not believe me. And I was charged uh, with robbery and murder, and that's why they sentenced me to death. Although there were no witnesses, the court fully accepted the police report, which blamed Tahir for the incident, and he was sent to death row. His brother Amjad remembers the family being told the terrible news. You know, we were all shocked. Our initial reaction was that uh, it cannot be true. So I'm sure that somebody's made a mistake. Then my dad, he just, my mom packed him a bag and uh, he boarded an aircraft uh, straight for Pakistan. When a death sentence is handed to a prisoner in a court. They never explain the details. They just say that you are sentenced to death, and the prisoner uh, starts wo uh, believing that uh, as soon as he's taken back to the prison, he'll be hanged. <laughs> the conditions were very harsh and brutal. The food was very basic, and if he didn't have a lifeline with extended family and the British High Commission, I don't think so he would have survived. It's very difficult even to spend a few moments <laughs> there, but with time we develop uh, you know, uh, ways, you know, to keep yourself busy or not to think that you are death row prisoner. I tried my best not to be lonely. <laughs> Unfortunately, my dad could not bear the you know this basic uh, ordeal and suffering of my of his son uh, and he always longed to the day when his son be acquitted and be home but that was never the case he died a dejected man we as a family suffered likewise emotionally you know we had emotional roller coaster with you know him being on death row it was like for us it was psychological torture, and it was very long and hard-fought campaign spanning 18 years. For 14 of those years, the family battled the civil courts to have Tahir successfully acquitted, only for the religious Muslim Sharia court to reinstate the death penalty. With all legal avenues closed, Amjad started a political campaign. That's to uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair. This is from uh, Kate Allen, the director for Amnesty International. But I think Amnesty was instrumental in galvanizing and uh, fronting this campaign. Uh, and it was also a kind of a motivating thing for Tahir that kept him alive through these uh, difficult periods. All of a sudden, he started receiving letters from Amnesty members from United Kingdom and worldwide. I received quite a lot of mail and I also received letters from children. They all assured me that I was not forgotten and that uh, I was in their thoughts and prayers. It, it, in a sort of way, it kept me going, you know. <laughs> there are many of us in England thinking of you uh, wishing you will return to your family soon after your sufferings. My good wishes and regards from all the friends. It's just very difficult to describe in words, but it gives you a lot of strength and hope that even the people you have never met in your life 
uh, they are thinking and praying for you. In 2006, Tahir was twice within days of execution, and Amjad had to step up the campaign. Various eminent personalities got involved in uh, Tahir's case when they learned of the profound and miscarriage of justice. Prince Charles, for instance, Tony Blair, the European leaders, United Nations rapporteurs as well. Grand Mr. Hussain's support. Following a visit from Prince Charles, President Musharraf changed Tahir's death penalty to an 18-year prison sentence, a term he'd already served. So in November 2006, he was released immediately. After a private reunion with the brother who's campaigned relentlessly for his release, Tahir re-emerged looking refreshed and reassured. I'm glad to be back home again. Thank you. I'm glad to it's, it's, It was just unbelievable, you know. <laughs> well, just like, you know, uh, being uh, on a starship of Captain Crook and transferred from one planet to another planet in, in moments, you know, in seconds. <laughs> when the plane arrived, uh, I think all the passengers waited and uh, he was first one off the aircraft. We took him to VIP lounge and uh, it was just sheer euphoria. My mother kept saying that I wouldn't believe anybody until I held you physically and hugged you. <laughs> so now I believe that uh, my son has been released. Tahir is slowly recovering with his brother's family in Leeds. He and Amjad are now campaigning for the worldwide abolition of the death penalty. Thirty years ago, on the other side of the world in Latin America, thousands of innocent people were imprisoned, tortured and killed by tyrannical military governments. Maria Gillespie now lives in Chester, but grew up in Uruguay in the 1970s at a time of political upheaval and military coups. You hear rumours of people being arrested and people disappearing and people being sentenced uh, for things that were not actually a crime. While still a teenager, Maria married a trade unionist but when the political situation deteriorated, he fled to Argentina and she was arrested, aged just 15. I was put in a room on my own, um, like a solitary confinement, and there were no windows, there was no, only a light. I think the main topic was if I could give them any information about where my husband was at the time. Um, and. I think they became very frustrated, really, because I could only tell them that he had gone to Argentina. They were, didn't make any allowances for my age. The questioning was, a, um, I think, a, more a bullying type of questioning, you know, tell me what I want to know. And um, they, um, initially, there were just threats of, uh, if you don't cooperate and if you don't answer the questions, we will pull your teeth out. Um, which it seemed to be so quite barbaric and therefore they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it because that was the way I felt about it. But um, they did pull them out. Um, and it was almost like for every question I couldn't answer, they would pull one teeth out. Um, but then there were no more teeth, really. And um, they will sort of ask a few questions and then say that um, the only solution was to shoot me. I will hear them sort of preparing the guns, or what it sounded like to me, that there were guns. And then uh, they will say, oh, we won't do it today because it's almost lunchtime and we will do it another day. So there was always that threat that perhaps um, one day when I was going to be questioned, um, I might have been shot. That was a hard time, really. After six months of torture, 
Maria was moved to a new cell, and to her great surprise, she started receiving letters from around the world. I got a card and addressed to Maria and saying, someone in Scotland saying, thinking of you, Margaret. I did manage to read them many, many times, and, and some of them had the, um, at the bottom of the card, Amnesty International. It became obvious to me that the fact I was receiving these cards, the treatment I was given was better. A year later, after receiving hundreds of letters, she was called to the prison governor's office. There was several sacks on the side of the, the office and they were saying those letters had been received on my behalf. And that one way of um, dealing with that was to release me. She left the prison in 1975 and fled to England. After many years of recovery, she joined Amnesty International and now gives talks on human rights. Today, she's at Upton by Chester School. It's the worst torture you had to put up with. Having my teeth pull out, I think. Because I'm sure most of you, you get up in the morning and uh, you put your uniform to come to school, but you start thinking you, you do your hair and you want to look nice. And suddenly there was me with hair that had been chopped, no teeth, looking like I'd just been, you know, gone through hell. It took me many, many years to, to actually be able to talk about my experience and also stop being bitter and angry uh, for what had happened. Tahir and Maria survived, but many others haven't or are still in prison. In 2007, nearly 4,000 people are on death row in 55 countries. Many are innocent of serious crimes, and campaigners believe writing them letters can highlight their cause. Lara Darabi is a young Iranian woman. She's 19 years old and is currently awaiting death by execution on death row. She is being punished for a murder which took place when she was 17 years old. The girls of Brynhavran School in South Wales campaigned to reduce such human rights abuses. They perform assemblies, sign petitions and write letters. They're currently supporting a 19-year-old on death row in Iran, Dalara Darabi, who claims she took the blame for a murder committed by her boyfriend. We want to get as many girls to sign the petition and we'll send it, we'll send it over to um, the Iranian ambassador and with all the signatures, hopefully they'll change their minds with the letters we're writing. People will say, well, you know, writing a letter, what difference does it make? It certainly it has, it's a, Tahir is a living proof. Just a postcard with one sentence will can save a life and can give someone the feeling that they're not forgotten. Thank you.